Good morning and welcome to our second panel discussion today on component shortages and avoiding counterfeits. A lot of companies uh, are having issues with component shortages at the moment and that's driving them into the grey market and running the risk of, of having counterfeits getting into the system. So we're going to discuss this with this panel. Uh, there's a couple of really interesting new uh, technologies coming in here uh, that might help address this problem. To my extreme right, we have uh, Redu Daikonescu from SMIC. Hi. Hi there. Uh, to his left, we have uh, Craig Lax from Septillion. Hi. Okay. And uh, to my right, we have uh, Michael Ford from Aegis, who's also on the IPC traceability committee driving this. Yep. Hello. Nice How to see you doing? again, Michael. Okay. So, according to the, the, the US military, uh, there's the reports that are saying that as much as 15% of their inventory. Uh, is counterfeit and 70% of that counterfeit can be traced back to China. So if this is happening in US military applications, what's it like in, the, in general manufacturing? You can only wonder, can't you? I mean, <laughs> um, a lot of the techniques for combating counterfeit kind of start and end with detection. Mm -hmm. Nobody really wants to come clean about how much they've actually found or imply a risk that they may not have found it. And right. so it is really, really difficult to get an understanding of that. But the US military, I think, have been extremely brave yeah, about no. putting this forward and saying, look, this has to stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's been a huge, uh, but the, the problem has only got worse with the, the uh, success of the industry over the last couple of years. You know, it's driven a lot of people onto the grey market. Uh, what do you think, Craig? Well, we, we work in uh, in other industries as well, and uh, it's it's pr it's common, common that uh, it's it, ten percent of global trade is is counterfeit across okay. every. You think about ten percent across the board, and that's that's you know one trillion uh, t one trillion dollar uh, market. So. market. Cr uh, I I think part of the problem is the fact that we actually have to ask this question, right? So if we don't know the extent into normal electronics manufacturing, I think this is part of the problem because normally it's, it's hard to eliminate all the counterfeit materials, but you have to start somewhere. And that start has to be realizing how much, the extent of, of the, the problem. problem of the problem. And the fact that we are not able to grasp how big the problem is, I think is actually the, the, the main issue that, that, yeah. that we're discussing. Well, that kind of circles back to Michael's issue point, which is people don't want to tell you. They don't, they want, to, they don't want to have their dirty washing in public. <laughs> that, that's one <laughs> aspect of it. But the other aspect of it is the, the fact that the supply chain in electronics is complicated, complex, and is getting even more complex. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's hard for any company or for any institution right now to have visibility across the spectrum. So to be, to be able to evaluate things across the supply chain. And that's probably one of the, the main issues that we're having that had. Okay. So what are our options? I don't think there are any more options just to continue the way we are. Um, we need to find, and what we've been talking about together, the three of us, um, within the, the bounds of IPC, we need to find a way that eradicates counterfeit completely. Right. So, um, using a combination of technologies of tamper-proof labeling, tamper-proof packaging, the use of blockchain to have tamper-proof data, to be able to make a secure tamper-proof handoff of information from original uh, material uh, manufacturers all the way through to those who would consume it. Right. Now, if we can, I mean, the way it reflects into traceability is that we can do that right now on the shop floor by taking data from machines and understanding if there is any issue with the material, we can trace that back to the exact package at which it arrived. Right. Now, that's fine, but we then need to be clear on who has the responsibility for that package arriving. And so what we've been doing is to put together the combination of ideas through the use of technologies to create that environment in which people who are using materials can see a package, can see it's not been tampered with, can read a label that cannot be copied, 
and they will accept that material on trust from their distributor and their supplier. Okay, the key, the key point to that is, of course, being able to read a label or some other marker that mm. cannot be copied. Absolutely. Um, what, what do you think well, about that, Craig? I mean, you're absolutely right. It's uh, when you're talking about traceability of physical assets. Mm. Uh, so you've got the, the, the physical world and the digital world. So you've got serialization solutions where you can, you know, track and trace essentially, but you're always got the physical asset. So you have to look at physical solutions um, and whether that's tamper, tamper proof labels or solutions built into the products themselves or um, some kind of covert solution, some, you know. What, what, what is Septillion uh, suggesting to use as markers for this? Well, or I mean, identifiers, should I it's, say. It's horses for courses as well. So, you know, not one solution won't fit every every component, every material, but so you know, you will need to use a, a combination of technologies. Mm -hmm. um, but our, our, you know, we're looking at uh, a covert tagging technology that can be applied to packaging, labeling, uh, and, and com certain components, uh, you know, materials. Mm -hmm. okay. so. Radu, what, what, is, what is SMIC working on? SMIC is a, a consortium of uh, companies, uh, so what are you? What is the consortium's approach to this problem? So we're we're essentially building a, a consortium of companies relevant in for the for the value chain of on one hand the electronics industry and on the other hand the, the whole product um, product design and manufacturing. So we plan to go also into additive CNC and other other types of manufacturing but we 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 are building this this consortium is because we we think that the problems that we have at hand are too big for one company to solve regardless of how big that company is or how much leverage that company has in the industry it's just from from a one company perspective you cannot push change throughout the supply chain and that's where the whole I mean, the, the, the consortium idea uh, came into place and also working with, with IPC because IPC has, let's say, the, the oversight over the whole industry and can see and can, can impose some sort of best practices um, in a non-biased way. Right. And I mean, once you get the methodology agreed, basically you need to then encapsulate it in a, in a, in a standard. Uh, so exactly. that everybody's working with the same the same rule book, basically. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was interesting uh, in in the meeting that we had yesterday. Um, it's clear about how much concern and interest there is about the ingress of counterfeit materials and mm -hmm. how helpless people seem to feel. So what we wanted to do in the meeting was to bring your know, guys like these two guys together with their examples of technology. I mean, the, the packaging here, we've got little fibers embedded within paper. You light them up with a UV light and you can see this is like a fingerprint. Right. And th there are other technologies as well that will do work in different places. But we have the technologies right now. We look at blockchain. I mean, there are several people producing blockchain. We had a little demonstration about how we can track securely the movement of materials, even unpacking them, repacking them, consigning them. The information is there. And I'm getting too old to continue to talk about these kind of problems without actually finding solutions. Right. And I think that IPC, you know, through things like CFX before yeah. it, are really in the right place now to start this new age of yeah. standards that are going to apply throughout the whole industry, not just of electronics, but well, well, well beyond. We have to start somewhere, and as you said, go step by step. Right. So here's the line in the sand. Here's the line that reflects the will of the market that says we cannot continue without a standard and without using the technologies that we have to solve the problem that if we don't do anything is going to result absolutely, you know, it's not just likely, it's absolutely certainly in a world changing event. Yeah. Because yeah. we've got counterfeit products in military, yep. in aerospace, driverless cars, it's not acceptable. Absolutely not. And no. so that's no. why no. we're it's driven a to do it It's a multi-billion dollar problem. Exactly. Um, talking, taking the topic of um, blockchain, blockchain obviously you're talking about using that for the the, um, the uh, vehicle for 
transporting this data uh, securely. Is that fail safe? Not on its own. No. Not on its own. Okay. Um, and you know, there's. Uh, I mean, it's it's cryptographically secure. Um, it's um, it. You know, it's it's a it's a good digital uh, platform. Mm -hmm. A good digital shared data infrastructure. Right. Um, but of course, again, you're 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 dealing with physical assets, and that's. Right. Where we come in, you know. So, Rado, I mean, your 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 group is also looking at blockchain as as, as the method of yep. transporting this data securely. Yeah. Uh, so, I think this question about security has a lot of layers. So, um, a blockchain in itself, by default, is public, right? Um, and that's one of the advantages because being public, you can authenticate, you can you can manage, you can log data. Uh, and everybody agrees on, on universal truth, and then you can you can refer to that and see any potential conflicts. Now, from that, there are a lot of of technologies and a lot of algorithms that can provide certain protections in certain aspects. So, um, to your question, yes, it is secure. And um, we can have, we can design, and that's that's what we are trying to do at, at SMIC to design exactly the right pieces. So to define, for example, what data needs to be public, and what data can be stored directly on the blockchain. For what data do we need to to use zero knowledge proof? So zero knowledge proof is a is a concept where uh, we can talk about certain pieces of data and I can make sure that you know a certain secret without you revealing that secret publicly. Right. Right. So those are those are uh, highly sophisticated algorithms that come into place. So by by defining this this standard together with with, with IPC, um, I think this is the place where, where we need to pay attention and we need to think of Yes, here we need to. We, we we actually benefit from having the, the data uh, public mm -hmm. uh, and having the public blockchain because that actually ensures if you have a public blockchain, you have a high number of nodes. It ensures a security, right? So the, the network cannot be attacked, right? Or it cannot be attacked easily or cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, I love the way you described it in the meeting yesterday because you know, let, let's say we had a hundred people in the meeting. Mm -hmm. Everybody takes meeting notes. Right. One person decides to change something because they, they want to influence the result. Mm. But you've got 99 other copies that disagree with that. Now blockchain divides the data up in the same way. Mm. And if 99 people think one thing and one person thinks something else, obviously you're going to go with the majority. Right. And that's as simple as blockchain is. Right. It's simply a matter that you cannot you know, tamper with the result unless you were to tamper with 51 copies of the truth. And trying to locate those and get into and hack into that is virtually impossible. Possible, right. Because you don't even know where they are. Yeah, and that's, that's the main difference between a private and a public blockchain. Right? Because in a private blockchain, if we decide to do, uh, and, and that's coming back to, to the main to the, to points I mentioned earlier, where a, a blockchain initiative has to be industry-wide. Um, if, if, if we, you have a private blockchain that is actually prone to attacks because you have a certain company with its suppliers, that's a limited number of nodes. Right. However, if you, if you rely on a public blockchain that is Infinite. used worldwide <laughs> and yeah. that has nodes everywhere, it's like storing copies of your data virtually uh, in, uh, around the world, right? right. So uh, a, a malicious actor will have a very hard time to, to break into those uh, those networks. Now, other problems arise, yes, like what's public, what's private, how we ensure privacy of data. This is something extremely important from the, for the industry, but it's manageable. Right, okay. Um, we're in very short time, so I'm gonna skip to my last question here, which is basically, um, if we are successful in getting end-to-end -end, uh, security and encryption for, for materials, um, what is going to be the effect on the industry? Who's, who's going to, who are going to be the winners and the losers in this? Because you know, there's a lot of people along that supply chain that this is going to touch. Yeah, it's going to basically 
I'll say revolutionized, but it's actually kind of going backwards. <laughs> mm. um, the people who are making the materials are going to be able to have one system of labeling defined by the standard using different technologies, okay? Mm. So um, fewer labels. <laughs> yeah, they're going to be able to define the exact uh, information about that material, length, width, height, contents, all of that kind of traceability information. That flows secure, securely then to the distributors. Now, the distributor will be able to subdivide that and still create secure packaging so that when that goes to the end consumer, there is that bond of trust between them. Now, that bond of trust goes back up the supply chain so that you've got a, a vendor of, of, let's call it chips, very expensive chips perhaps, and maybe their brand image is being affected now by their chips being counterfeit. Because counterfeit can be eliminated, mm -hmm. their brand name does not suffer that loss of value. Right. Their customers are happy to continue to use more and more of their products. The distributors are now trusted by the suppliers. There's no need now for this increased incoming inspection. There's no need for so much x-raying of components, although still people will want to do it. Yep. But they are safe in the knowledge that were any counterfeit to get in there, it would be tracked back to the source and that mm -hmm. person prosecuted. Right. So unlike today, that prevents them from doing that. They'll go off and counterfeit something else perhaps, but it won't come to me as a manufacturer. Right. That's what changed. We re-established that bond of trust. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we are all reducing our costs because the end manufacturer gets all of the detail about the material. And so they save money having to re-engineering what is this material, what batch, what supplier, etc. So we're building into the rules the method for people to gain benefit at each stage. Right, right. So I agree. You said a lot in that statement there. And of course, there's a whole industry around at the moment through um, X-ray for counterfeiting and all that sort of thing. But that essentially, they will still X-ray, but it'll become more a quality issue rather than a Exactly, uh, um, exactly, yeah. Uh, a verification issue. Greg, uh, what's your view on this? Well, I mean, one of the, one of the reasons why this has not been done mm -hmm. is because, you know, who, who's going to, you need a trusted third party. You know, like, like a bank is a trusted third party or, a, right. or an attorney or solicitor. Um, but blockchain doesn't need that trusted third party. Mm -hmm. um, it, the, the, the network maintains the state of the data and that, you know, that, that, that's really what's going to enable this to happen. Right. Um, you just don't, you know, you can, you, right. you're all managing the same data. But it's going to be kind of difficult if, if the originator is, is Chinese. I mean, you're not going to be able to necessarily prosecute him that easily, but I guess he'll be prosecuted in, in the sense that people just won't buy from him. Exactly. That, that's <laughs> yeah. exactly the way it should go. It's naturally right. driven. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Gentlemen, we're running right out of time, unfortunately. Uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up there, um, but um, I think we want to continue this debate, surely, in, in, in articles and discussions in the future. And I really want to thank you all for joining us today. So, uh, Rado from SMIC at the end there, uh, Craig Lax from Septillion, and of course, uh, Michael Ford from IPC and Aegis. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you Thanks. very much for joining thank us. And thank you for watching. <laughs>